Any objections to getting started? Okay, great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming today. This will be a little bit of an atypical uh, presentation for me in that it's not going to be a lot of heavy science. It's more a discussion, what will hopefully be a discussion at the end, about kind of the philosophy of science. And this is something that is, you know, from really the time of Darwin into modern day, is still this, you know, cultural debate about, uh, you know, how we, how we explain how we got here. And so, uh, to that end, I also want to say that, again, there are some very heavy views and uh, beliefs on, in this issue. And that the one thing I do want to kind of particularly say is that if you're someone who has a very strong uh, belief system in creationism or intelligent design, I'm not here to, in an overarching sense, try and tell you uh, you're wrong or shouldn't believe that. But one thing is that within these, these range of arguments you can make for why you think that your belief system describes the, the real world, these are actually not good arguments. These are not winning arguments on the side. Um, okay, so again, the, it's a two-part talk. I'm going to talk about this. Uh, I'm going to make some criticism of the idea of irreducible complexity, which is one of these arguments from the design institute that wants to argue a, uh, well, let's just call it creationism light. And then a biological basis for morality, which is a, uh, I think, you know, one other point of view that the religious side tends to make is that we have to have religion and we have to have that in order to like have society and have morality. And I want to make the argument, again, there, there are many arguments one can make that that is not a, um, uh, a valuable point of uh, a, uh, a a rhetorically strong uh, argument, but I want to actually provide an alternative way of thinking. Instead of attacking that idea, I want to make sure that we think about and provide a, a platform for describing what could be a basis for morality. All right. Um, I used to teach college biology, and I did actually teach an honors um, philosophy, history of biological sciences class at Ball State University. And um, again, in Second Life, I tend to come here for this. All right. Um, let me start with an analogy from you know, a couple centuries ago now, uh, from William Paley. And his argument, and this is something you might have heard here and there, is that if you're walking, you know, if a person were to be walking along a beach, and then they were look down and see a clock, uh, or a pocket watch, that they would have really no alternative to say that because of the complexity of it, that it must have been designed, that somehow a particular uh, intelligence, a particular engineer made that. And the analogy then that they have for this particular, or what they're trying to analogize is the idea that biological complexity, uh, the, the interactions and the, compl the complicated complexity of DNA, RNA, proteins, enzymes that interact and are very uh, machine-like in certain ways must have been designed. That's an argument for a creator who helped put it together. Another line of argumentation, and this is, again, this more particular narrow view of irreducible complexity, is that not only do you have this complexity, but if you were to take any part out of it, then it just wouldn't work. And so that means it must have been put together whole cloth. That is it derived from something, but it had to be there. And the example that I like and people like to use are, are mouse traps. And so I'm showing the mouse trap game from uh, from Hasbro. And if you've ever played this, uh, you know, there's just this complicated step of processes to get the ball to knock down the mouse trap, which uh, which is fun. Uh, and this is, again, the kind of generalized term for this. This is like a Rube Goldberg machine. And he was, a, uh, I believe, a cartoonist back in 
early 1900s who made these very complicated devices or these chains of events. And you also might have seen this in a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Or even a Wile E. Coyote trying to catch the Roadrunner where there's a, this complicated combination of things. And if any part of that's missing, then that particular machine won't work. And so again, a very nice analogy to uh, try and convince people that this is relevant to uh, biological systems. All right. And then in particular, I don't know how many, uh, show me in local chat if, um, if you're someone who has read this, Michael Behe, who is a biochemist, and he's at Lehigh University, he wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box. And the idea here is that he took very specific examples of complicated protein, quote unquote, machinery, or uh, pathways in which, uh, you know, every intermediate step is important for the final process. And he argued that evolution cannot account for these. Or, you know, the current evolutionary theory can account for those. And so let me just uh, give the two particular examples that on the left-hand side is the flagellum. And I wish I had a working flagellum. I think there are some in Second Life, where this is actually a motor that's controlled. And then this is an it's an anchor for, you know, this little whip-like appendage that then can actually move, um, again, the outer co the outer florence, sorry, the outer flow, if something is, is uh, attached to a substrate, or you can take, or you can think of it as, um, you know, for bacteria that actually uses, they use that to move around. They have, actually have this mobility. And so it's, again, it looks a lot like a machine. And then the other example he gave is, you know, the blood coagulation pathway, where there are several factors going from, I think, all the way from one to 10 or 12, where these are, again, are just particular enzyme steps that help put together a final coagulation product, including platelets and other things called fibrinogen that, you know, create clots. And so his argument is that, again, if you take any one of these out, then the system doesn't work. And so there's also a disease in which there are a couple forms of these that are missing, uh, hemophilia. And so, again, hemophiliacs are not able to clot their blood. They, uh, again, in a pre-medical intervention stage, they would basically just bleed out as young people anytime they had any sort of uh, impact or movement. Even at their joints, they would get bruises, and it was quite, quite painful and fatal. All right, so I, I think that's a basic description of the argument that, you know, because there are these things that exist in biological organisms, and they're so complex, if you take any part away, they don't work, and the organism should die or not be, not have this fitness, then biology is explained by a designer. Okay, anybody have any quick questions on that? I can entertain any um, questions. Again, there are lots of examples of this that one could use. Uh, I will say one thing. I, I actually have read Michael Behe's Darwin's Black Box book. I think I'm probably one of the few practicing bio biologists who's done so. Uh, and actually, the thing was, is given I think it was written in the 1970s, it actually was this interesting intellectual challenge. The first nine, eight or nine chapters were these like posing, I think, a biologically important relevant question is, how does evolution, or how do we explain this? How do we explain these? And of course, this very last chapter was that the answer was, oh, we don't have a great explanation for it right now, so it must be God. And I, I, I just want to point out that this is a line of thinking that uh, the creationists and the intelligent design proponents tend to do. And what they will frequently do is actually purposefully ignore <laughs> uh, any sort of scientific evidence any sort of evolutionary evidence that over time does account for these things. And the other thing they also will do is they'll create a goalpost of saying, oh, we expect this. And then you actually provide some component of explanation. Because again, science is iterative. Science doesn't necessarily always provide a final answer to something, but it provides what is a currently best known explanation. The expectation will have a, a more refined view later. They just tend to ignore that. And so, yeah, so, so scissor, this syzygy is correct, is we're going to deconstruct those arguments. Now, again, uh, I know William Paley is not here to uh, defend his argu line of argumentation, but this idea that if you see something that is complex and that it must have been engineered, it poses, I think, a very important question. 
where is the watch porn? And the reason I bring this up is that the analogy of a clock, or again, any sort of complicated mechanical device, is a completely flawed analogy to biological systems. If a person, or let's just say an alien were to come along and be walking on the beach, and were to be noticing people, or sharks, or jellyfish, they might look at that and say, well, as I study this, there is a clear explanation for how these things can evolve. And that is reproduction, the ability to uh, have simple chemical reactions that code information that then is mutable, and that, again, over a period of time, can lead to more complex systems because there is an advantage to them. And so I think that, um, again, one, one key thing is that it's, it's a completely flawed analogy of mechanical devices to biological systems. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Now, in terms of Michael Behe's irreducible complexity arguments, again, when you think about something like the flagellum, then, you know, in a biological system, uh, there are several things you can do. One, you can actually analyze and understand what the genes are and see how the genes relate to other genes in biological systems. But then even from a, just a, a structural point of view, is that the very, the idea of irreducible complexity would mean that there aren't similar things existing in systems that were building component parts for that. And so here's a nice example, is that the ATP synthase machinery. And one thing that's not, again, depicted here, I would invite you to, to look at some of the more uh, exciting um, videos of this. The ATP synthase is also a crank. And this is something that as, um, as you actually power the crank with protons and basically protons and electrons, you actually turn this around in a way that promotes the a chemical reaction of putting of taking ADP and turning that, adding a third phosphate, the P stands for phosphate, and putting that last third phosphate on. And then this is really important that the vast majority of biochemical reactions are powered by leaving that third phosphate off of the adenosine diphosphate. And that's how a lot of biological reactions are powered. It's a storage batteries chemical reaction for the cell. So this more, you know, in a sense, reduced, simplified system, when you actually look at the genes for it, these are actually uh, related genes. And that this crank that's used for making ATP, you can imagine with some modification and again, some evolution that you put a flagellum on it and boom, you have actually a motor. Um, and then even going beyond that, you know, you might say, well, well, okay, fine, those are similar, but they're actually an intermediate between the two. And in fact, there is that this this uh, mechanical device that, um, again, bacteria have is called an injectosome, right? And this is something where uh, when it comes time to delivering a toxin to um, some other organism, either protecting itself or it's a pathogen, that this is also something where you have this crank that's at the base, the green, and then this actually rotates in a way to shoot a, um, you know, basically the equivalent of a lance and deliver the payload across, you know, across a membrane. And so this is, again, when you think about these as, oh, really complicated, complex, irreducible machinery, then in fact they're not. You actually can reduce them down, and then we can see in the, bi in the uh, biological system, we can actually see these reduced forms of the, uh, of the device. And again, this is how evolution will work. Evolution is something where uh, you can actually, it's all repurposing. Right, it's like almost all ad adapting, repurposing mach stuff that you already have uh, to do this. And let me, this is a more subtle point, is that a lot of times you'll hear design institute people say, oh, well, point mutations don't account for this type of building of complexity. And that is actually a very logical and rational sound argument. But point mutations are not the only type of genetic change that's possible. Uh, there's things like gene duplication, there's also recombination. There's also uh, lateral transfer of genes from one organism to another. So, you know, they, they will try and say stuff that's very truthful. And I think one thing I want to say about that is when you hear them make certain arguments, unless you're actually very familiar with the tech, technicalities of the field, they are technically correct, but they're absolutely and totally misleading. 
And I do want to say that I think when you really burrow down that their purposefulness at being sly that way, I think betrays the fact that they are being purposeful. All right, and then one last argument, and again, this is one that uh, has been made by smarter scientists than I am who've engaged in these debates. This, this is something that Kenneth Miller talked about as a witness in the Dover trial. And so this was an example in Pennsylvania where uh, some townspeople wanted intelligent design uh, biology textbooks to be used in the public school system. And they sued. And again, the defendants in courts eventually uh, you know, they prevailed in court. But uh, there is a, a really good documentary by Nova that I really recommend, and that's in the notes, but also show the, uh, the... And again, this is idea, this coming back to this idea that any single part missing, and it won't work. And they were talking about, again, the mousetrap that a lot of people are familiar with, not the Hasbro version. And what Ken Miller said and showed in court and has in the video is that, yeah, there are five parts of this mousetrap. And yeah, you take any part of it away, and it doesn't work as a mousetrap. But if you think of just the base and the spring, well, that actually can work as a tie clip. And this is a really good simplified analogy for describing how biological systems work. That, yeah, maybe at one point you have something that's making you ATP, and that's a simplified version of it. But then you find through some you know random genetic change and find a use for it in a different mode, then you have that. And in fact, one thing to keep in mind too, is that you can have both at the same time, right? You don't give up the ATP th synthase to then make the flagellum. You actually have both existing in cells at the same time. And, this is, and that's also a line of argumentation that you hear sometimes where the design people will say, oh, well, if we evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? And it's like, well, no, that's actually, uh, that's not how biology works. There's something to keep in mind that we both had a common ancestor and that, you know, humans, First of all, it's just false to say that we evolved from monkeys uh, because we both evolved from a common ancestor. And you can have multiple organisms living and existing at the same time. All right. Um, any questions on this kind of reducing irreducible complexity elements, some other people's lines of argument? So I, I want to go into a different line of thought, which is, you know, you can make these criticisms um, and I think they are good analogies and they're, they're relatively easy to understand, but it really sounds like you're not trying to talk to your audience and providing kind of a nice analogy that they can, they can sympathize with, right? You can turn about and say, oh, this is, this is something that doesn't work, but because uh, the next segment, I want to talk about the evolution of the handgun, right? And this is kind of the same level of argument. If you look at this, right, you look at the say, this is this bread in 92 and other modern day weaponry. These are super engineer fine, refined examples of irreducible complexity. You take out the trigger, this thing doesn't work. You take out the, uh, the barrel, it doesn't work. And that is true. And I just wanna provide kind of a, again, a little bit of an analogy of how these types of things progress. And this is, you know, analogizes to some of the parts of the way evolution works. Yeah, these are devices, buttons also, there's not a porn industry for guns because they don't have sex, but as an analogy, I think it's kind of a good one. All right. Um, I do want also want to point out, I am in no way a gun expert. I have a shotgun, I believe, also, which was a very fun time. And uh, as an open invitation, if anybody's coming through Des Moines, I will, that you're a gun fanatic, happy to go pay for the rounds and the firing range fees, and we can go shoot and talk evolution. Okay, so, uh, so this information is derived from a largely PBS website called History Detectives. And they do this nice little evolution of the gun where I'm actually just largely directly quoting and taking the, the key parts. Um, although I will also say that the Wikipedia page on handguns, um, it, it must have gotten reorganized in the past year or two because it definitely provides a nice more historical example. Um, all right, that's, so I'm getting a, a a message that my voice is sounding odd from time to time. I'm just gonna turn off my voice and click it back on. But that could also just be, um, I do weird inflections sometimes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, 
hope I meant to record this too on my on a local device. Oh well. Um, yeah, if there are network problems, then there's not much I can do about it, unfortunately. All right. Um, okay, so the, the the handgun. Let's go back to uh, you know uh, seven hundred years ago. That um, this picture. This is a gun. A gun was just a barrel, and what you would do is you would stuff a, a, a wad of gunpowder at the bottom and then you would put a round lead ball and then stuff that down with a with a stick and then basically you would use one hand as well as a prop a, a, a way of holding it up and you would just take basically take a match <laughs> well not a match but you know like a lighted piece of cloth and just touch it to the gunpowder and it would shoot right so a very simplified way of a uh, of firing a high velocity projectile. And this, you know, in a certain way, this absolutely zero resembles the Breda 92, but on the other hand, you can see a platform, a basis for which to build upon and ultimately modify that. All right, uh, moving forward, the matchlock appears. And the idea here is that you have this kind of, essentially a, uh, a curved piece of metal that works through the, um, through the uh, through the gun, and it basically you have a wick, you have a light a wick on the end of it, and you just touch it down to that rag that has gunpowder, and boom. So again, not much more complicated, but again, a nice little small thing where the main advantage is that you can now just hold and brace the gun in two hands, and then just do one fine movement to ignite the the boom so that you can hold two hands and aim better. You don't need a prop anymore. Right. And then this concept, um, where you basically can have a wheel lock to generate a spark. So now you no longer need to actually have like open flame, which again, not a lot, hard to do a firefight in a rainstorm in that particular case, and can basically mechanically start that fire and ignite the gunpowder. And so again, you'll notice that what you have here is a selective pressure, which is a need to be able to fire guns when it's wet, and then something that also just works more efficiently. But of course, one thing it would require would be the idea of using, um, say, flint, uh, you know, a combination of flint and steel to be able to create that initial spark. All right. Um, the next one is the, yeah, the flintlock where again, you have this, um, basically the trigger, where again, the combination of these things allow you to hold the, uh, the barrel of the gun very simply, and then just a very small amount of motion required to actually just ignite, ignite the gunpowder. And so again, something that is a nice little small evolution. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that this is something that's occurred over a period of time where um, the, the there's been a lot of fine tuning of one component of the system, right? There's not a lot that's different between that you still load a, uh, something from the muzzle, but you have this nice refinement. So, so there's not a lot of difference, but there's enough to make it much more efficient and useful in the system. All right, and again, you'll see about 300 years have passed in terms of the timing. All right, so as the, uh, this is like the big, I think the next big advance. And that is the idea that the idea of a percussion cap. And again, the, this was based on the discovery of very specific chemistry that the ability of the of something to create a boom, a something that can create a compressive power, was based on some discovering chemistry, right? And so this is a combination of mercury, nitric acid, and alcohol, and mercuric, so called mercuric fulmerate. And so now you have this other mechanism of delivering these things. So again, this is bringing in ideas from chemistry and then applying it to this mechanical problem of being able to shoot bullets. I know again, these percussion cap guns, this would be something that would occur, say, one at a time, but it would allow you to basically develop a bullet so that um, you have basically have the, pre the preformed bullet that can then be exploded. And that also means that you're kind of redesigning the idea of what a, what a bullet actually is. And then, of course, so now one thing you actually have, sorry, let me go back, that the percussion caps become in general used about 1825. 
And it actually doesn't take very long to evolve a repeater system. So again, the Colt Revolver, the idea here is that now you can basically have a, uh, you have the, the gun mechanism where you can basically preload several bullets in a rotating wheel and have the, um, have the, um, oh, the trigger, not, not the trigger, the, uh, oh, dang it. Uh, the part of the gun that hits the percussion cap basically just repeat this. And so now you've, the hammer, thank you, gosh, I'm blanking, that, um, that you can actually have, you've taken a major step forward in the, in the ability to change how the thing works from a kind of mechanical point of view, and then you can very rapidly evolve other ways of making that even more efficient. And so I think this is kind of a nice example of, when we think about how evolution works, is that a lot of times things don't work in a very gradual, slow sense. What they will do is boom, 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 uh, something, you'll have lots of very rapid evolution very shortly after you make a, a major change or discovery in the platform. All right. Um, and then uh, the ability to use pin fire cartridges and uh, that, again, slight modifications to the chemistry of the bullet so that you basically have these very fine-tuned ways of, of, um, of, of um, igniting the reaction that leads to uh, the compression or the decompression. So um, again, and there's one point on here that I do want to make a, a point about, which is that if you look on the left-hand side here in 1854 through 56, you know, muzzle-loaded guns are still being used in major conflicts. Okay, and that's the idea here is that, um, and this is like what I was saying earlier, is that just because you've evolved something one way and you have something that's a more optimal way of dealing with, you know, some sort of selective pressure, then you don't, you haven't gotten rid of all the air stuff. The air stuff doesn't appear it's still here. All right. Uh, so Winchester guns, again, the idea of being able to uh, load multiple bullets at a time, and then also introduce cartridges so that you can have, uh, again, not just the wheel like the handgun, but actually larger volumes of bullets feed into the system so that you can actually fire multiple bullets at a time. Um, and again, the Winchester, I think, again, something classically known about from the Western United States. But this idea of being able to start repeating, so basically have a higher rate of fire and you know, being able to carry more ammunition around within a system before reloading is again, this other evolution that now that you've developed uh, efficient bullets and decompression technology that again, that becomes very useful. And again, it's meeting the need of being able to, again, you know, fire and hit more targets. And of course that leads to the example of, again, in modern day times, and this is where we're gonna kind of end the analogy, is that uh, automatic handguns, where again, you have these, um, pistols that have these reloadable cartridges, a trigger, uh, uh, bullets that are rapidly loading, and again, very high rapid rate of fire. And again, you've, you're also reducing the technology down in size in that you're making, you're taking a technology like you have with the rifle and you're basically being able to optimize it for smaller and smaller. Um, yeah, so Yuri is pointing, he's saying that cartridge weaponly are shotgun type weapons, which are a different function and goal than a rifle or a handgun. Uh, yeah, mechanically distinct. I just wanted to make you know so the, the 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 point of the value of it to the system, and in terms of thinking about it and making that next step in the evolution of the handgun. Although again, I just I can't say that I can picture and mentally understand all of the mechanics of the two systems. So again, uh, in terms of trying to uh, uh, point out that, you know, you can take a snapshot in time and say, this is something that's irreducibly complex. And you can take something like the gun, which I've used here, but you can also think about things like cars, planes, uh, phones. These are all things that from a, you know, we, they definitely are designed, they hit a certain purpose, but you can't take any given snapshot and say, oh, this just kind of came out of whole cloth. This is just, you know, obviously this had to have been designed this particular way that even in the development of technology, we look at, you know, platforms that have, you know, iterative steps that make it to its refined step. All right. So 
Any questions about that analogy? Again, I think, you know, the point is that, if, you know, if you're having a conversation with someone who kind of wants to um, uh, make that argument that, that just point out that, well, there were previous versions of handguns and, that's, and they actually do evolve over time and there, there are reasons why this works. Okay, so the last point I want to talk, okay, thank you, Yuri. <laughs> um, Yuri says that my general, I think my, my idea is correct and that's, uh, we'll leave it at that. I wish I were a gun expert. It's actually really cool. Um, got pretty fascinating reading about a lot of it. Okay, so um, I'm going to start here talking about the last segment, a biological basis for morality. And again, I just took definitions from Merriam-Webster to say concerning what is right or wrong, uh, ideas of what are good standards of behavior, how people should treat each other, um, that this is a line of argument that if you don't have religion, if you don't have a creator, then how can you have any basis for morality? And I just want to kind of say that uh, there are multiple ways to argue that that is not correct. And I invite you, and I'm going to throw this into local chat here, a YouTube video, that if you just watch the first two minutes, you can see some lines of arguments of, uh, again, religion, creationism proponents who, who uh, are doing it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a cue from Q, who's recording this, and I'm going to go ahead and be quiet. And let him cue that up. I invite everyone here to watch it. Uh, and then when he's cued me, when Q has cued me, that he is done with the video recording, then I'll get started again. If God does not exist, why do all people have a fixed moral obligation to love and not murder? How do molecules in motion have any authority to tell you how to behave? When you do something wrong, whose standard are you breaking? Who are you displeasing? If life isn't sacred, then why is murder bad? Nobody likes the idea of an absolute, all-powerful, un unchanging authority, thus saith the Lord. People just don't like that. And the Bible says in Second Peter chapter 3, in the last days, scoffers would come who would be ignorant. And I think that's what we have is people who simply, they don't want God telling them what to do because the Bible chaps their hide. Well, I recommend you get some Vaseline because you're going to be judged by that book. Okay. <clears throat> it has to do with the ontological category known as morality. Where does morality come from? Does it come from the benzene molecule, the carbon molecule, the oxygen molecule? In your worldview, where does it come from? Um, my question is for Professor Dawkins. Considering that uh, atheism cannot possibly have any sense of absolute morality, would it not then be an irrational leap of faith, which atheists themselves so harshly condemn, for an atheist to decide between right and wrong? <coughs> Absolute morality, the, the, the absolute morality that a religious person might profess would include what? Stoning people for adultery? <laughs> death for apostasy? Uh, punishment for breaking the Sabbath? These are all things which are religiously based absolute moralities. I don't think I want an absolute morality. I think I want a morality that, that is thought out reasoned, argued, discussed, and... <laughs> based upon, I could almost say, intelligent design. <laughs> um, <laughs> can we not design our society which has the sort of morality, the sort of society that, that we want to live in? If you actually look at the, the moralities that are accepted among modern people, among 21st century people, we don't believe in slavery anymore. We believe in equality of women. Um, we believe in, in being gentle. We believe in being kind to animals. These are all things which are entirely recent. They have very little basis in biblical or Quranic scripture. They are, th they are things that have developed over historical time through a consensus of reasoning, sober discussion, argument, legal theory, political and moral philosophy. These do not come from religion. To the extent that you can find the good bits in religious scriptures, you have to cherry pick. You, you search your way through the Bible or the Quran and you find the occasional verse that is a, an acceptable profession of morality. And you say, look at that, that's religion. And you leave out all the horrible bits. <laughs>
And you say, oh, we don't believe that anymore. We've grown out of that. Well, of course we've grown out of it. We've grown out of it because of secular moral philosophy and rational discussion. If God is dead, isn't everything permitted? Isn't everything permissible? Uh, where would our ethics be if there was no superintending deity? This, again, seems to me a very profound insult to us in our very deepest nature and character. It is not the case, I submit to you, that we do not set about butchering and raping and thieving from each other right now uh, only because we're afraid of a divine punishment or because we're looking for a divine reward. It's an extraordinarily base and insulting thing to say to people. Um, on my mother's side, some of my ancestry is Jewish. I don't happen to believe the story of Moses in Egypt or the exile or the wandering in the Sinai. And in fact, now even Israeli archaeology has shown that there isn't a word of truth to that story or really any of the others. But take it to be true. Am I expected to believe that my mother's ancestors got all the way to Mount Sinai, quite a trek, under the impression until they got there that rape, murder, perjury, and theft were okay? Only to be told when they got to the foot of Mount Sinai, bad news, none of these things is kosher after all. <laughs> They're all forbidden. No, I don't think so. I think, I think we, can, we can actually have a better explanation in every sense. Superior as well as better, that no one would have been able to get as far as Mount Sinai or in any other mountain in any other direction unless they had known that human solidarity demands that we look upon each other as brothers and sisters and that we forbid activities such as murder, a rape, a perjury, and theft, that this is innate in us. Of those to whom it is not innate, the sociopaths who don't understand the needs of anyone but themselves and the psychopaths who positively take pleasure in breaking these rules, well, all we can say is, um, they, according to one theory, they're also made in the image of God, which makes the image of God question rather problematic, does it not? Or that they can be explained by further and better research and have to be restrained and disciplined meanwhile. But in no sense here is religion a help where it claims to help most, which is to our morality. Do you think there's a practical reason for having um, a religious belief for, for many people? Well, there can't be a practical reason for believing what isn't true. Uh, that's quite, uh, at least I rule it out as impossible. Either the thing is true or it isn't. If it is true, you should believe it, and if it isn't, you shouldn't. And uh, if you can't find out whether it's true or whether it isn't, you should suspend judgment. But you can't, uh, it seems to me, a fundamental uh, dishonesty and a fundamental treachery to intellectual integrity to hold a belief because you think it's useful and not because you think it's true. Well, I was thinking of those people who find that um, some kind of religious code helps them to live their lives. It gives them a very strict set of rules, the rights and the wrongs. Yes, but you know, there, those rules are generally quite mistaken. Uh, a great many of them do more harm than good. And uh, it would, uh, they would probably be able to find a rational morality that they could live by if they dropped this uh, irrational, traditional, taboo morality that comes down from savage ages. But are we, uh, perhaps, the ordinary person, perhaps isn't strong enough to find this own personal ethic. They have to have something imposed upon them from outside. Oh, I don't think that's true. And what is imposed on you from outside is of no value, whatever. It doesn't count. My view is that morality, our human morality, is older than religion. So instead of saying morality comes from God or religion gave us morality, for me that's a big no-no. Our current religions are just two or three thousand years old, which is very young, and our species is much older. And I cannot imagine that, for example, a hundred thousand years or two hundred thousand years our ancestors did not have some type of morality of course they had rules about how you should behave um, what is fair what is unfair uh, caring for others all of these tendencies were in place already so they had a moral system and then at some point we developed these present-day religions which I think were sort of tacked onto the morality that we had and maybe they served to codif codify them or to enforce them, or to steer morality in a particular direction that we prefer. And so, so religion comes in for me secondarily. I'm struggling with whether we need religion. So, so personally, I think we, we can be moral without religion, because we probably had morality long before the current religions came along. So I think we can be moral without religion. But in large-scale societies, 
where we we are not all keeping an eye on each other because we don't in societies with a thousand people or several thousand or millions of people we cannot all keep an eye on each other and that's maybe why we installed religions in these large-scale societies where a god kept watch over everybody and then the question becomes is this really needed now in northern europe i'm from the netherlands there is basically an experiment going on in northern europe the majority of people are not religious anymore when you when you ask them they say they're non-believers and they still have a moral society as far as i can tell and so um, there is a sort of experiment going on there. Can we set up a society where religion is not dominant at least? It may be present, but it's not dominant anymore. That is still a moral society. And until now, I think that experiment is going pretty well. And so I'm optimistic that religion is not strictly needed. But I begin by asking, and I'm asking my opponent as well as you when you consider your voting. Is it good for the world to appeal to our credulity and not to our skepticism? Is it good for the world to worship a deity that takes sides in wars and human affairs? To appeal to our fear and to our guilt, is it good for the world? To our terror, our terror of death, is it good to appeal? To preach guilt and shame about the sexual act and the sexual relationship, is this good for the world? And asking yourself the while, are these really religious responsibilities, as I maintain they are? To terrify children with the image of hell, and eternal punishment, not just of themselves, but of their parents and those they love. Perhaps worst of all, to consider women an inferior creation. Is that good for the world? And can you name me a religion that has not done that? To insist that we are created and not evolved in the face of all the evidence. Religion forces nice people to do unkind things and also makes intelligent people say stupid things. Handed a small baby for the first time, is it your first reaction to think, beautiful, almost perfect. Now please hand me the sharp stone for its genitalia that I may do the work of the Lord. No. <laughs> it is, uh, as, the great, um, as the great physicist Steven Weinberg has very aptly put it, in the ordinary moral universe, the good will do the best they can, the worst will do the worst they can. But if you want to make good people do wicked things, you'll need religion. Now, yeah, Andrew here in Austin. Now one Hi, uh, did you read Matthew 5, 27 and 28? Sure, I've read the whole Bible several times. Okay, do you know what it says there? Is that do the passage to... about uh, adultery where it doesn't just have to be physical adultery? If you look at another, woman, uh, another man's wife with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart? Exactly. It says, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Sure. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's, how do you not think that that's a good thing for people to have limits you, you think on... That's, you think that's a good it's called, thing? It's called mind control. You're trying to determine what I think and what I don't think. That's but one that's, of the stupidest if, things I could imagine. How can you control or even pretend to control what somebody thinks? That is Jesus, what Jesus said right how, there. Well, yeah. first, first, first of all, we'll, we'll set aside how you think you know that this is what Jesus said. Second of side, we'll, we'll set aside whether or not it matters whether Jesus said it. I don't care who said it. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And so if somebody says, now I will say, if a man looks on a woman lustfully, he's committed adultery in his heart, is absolutely wrong. Because first of all, he's not necessarily married, and adultery is uh, specifically a, a lustful or sexual action that extends beyond the bounds of marriage. So as a single person, looking on a woman lustfully isn't adultery. And by the way, I put it to you that almost nobody on the planet outside of arranged marriages would have ever gotten married or had sex if they hadn't looked at someone of the opposite sex lustfully. And finally, why is it a man looking at a woman lustfully? Why isn't it a woman looking at a man lustfully? lustfully or a man looking at a man or a woman looking at a woman? Don't you think it's important to have limits on your sexual, sexual desires? Otherwise, everyone would just be raping everyone. Really? You think people would just run around raping people? How do you get from, it's probably a good thing if people don't run around raping each other, to therefore this statement about lustful thoughts is necessarily morally correct? Please make the connection between those two. How do you get from, we should have some limits to what we can do, to we need to, we need to have thought crime legislation? How do, well, you, how do you get there? What limits do atheists have? Well, what culture, tell me one culture that doesn't have limits, and it's, I mean, there's all, every culture on the face of the earth has limits, and it's, they're not Christian cultures. Chinese culture has got limits, Japanese, the most secular country in the world is Japan, they have the lowest 
rape rate. Denmark, but, Sweden, but, they, it, very unreligious places, religion, and they don't religion. have any rape problem. We have much more rape in the United States and by than the they way, ever do in Denmark or Sweden. Religion doesn't seem to, to, to be any kind of deterrent to rape. Are you implying that all rapists are non-Christians or non-religious? What about the, the priests who are raping little boys and little girls? Well, I just where, got do back get, from, where do you get your limits from? I get my limits from a rational consideration of the consequences of my actions. That's how I determine what's moral. I get it from a foundation that says my actions have an effect on those people around me and theirs have an effect on me. And that if we're going to live cooperatively and share space, we have to recognize that impact. And my freedom to swing my arm ends at their nose. And that I have no right to impose my will over somebody else's will in that, in that type of scenario. Well, if you just do all that, let's just say you go out uh, with a gun and you just rape a bunch of people, then you just shoot what? yourself, what's going to be the punishment for you? If, if I go out and rape a bunch of people and shoot myself, what's going to be the punishment for me? Uh, I'll be dead? Hang it's going to hurt. The bullet's going to go through your head in about a second. There isn't going to be any pain. That's correct. I, I, I'll be dead. Okay, so let's, let's flip the script here. Let's say somebody goes around and rapes and murders somebody, and then after they're done, they get saved. What's the punishment for them? What? The punishment is hell. No, no, they, no, got, no, saved. they got saved. Also, are you they... saying that a rapist can't be saved? Uh... See, this is the problem. This is the problem with Christian religion. It establishes unrealistic and irrational and immoral criteria by which to live. And then it creates a loophole so that you don't ever have to be responsible for those actions. Then, then, okay, Chris, religion... No, Andrew, shut up till I'm done. Christianity is not a moral system. It is an immoral system because it specifically says that there aren't necessarily consequences that you're going to have to pay because of a loophole. And what is the loophole? It has nothing to do with how good you are or how morally you act or anything else. It has to do with whether or not you're willing to be a sycophant to an idea. And if you are, then there is now an exception for which you no longer have to suffer a penalty for this. So the idea that secular morality offers no guarantee that people will ever pay for their, their crimes and their, their atrocities is not an argument against secular morality because that is a tenet of Christianity. It is the foundation. Your, the idea that, that the Christian God is just is directly contradicted by the idea that the Christian God is merciful. Perfect justice and perfect in any mercy are, in, are necessarily directly in contradiction because mercy is a suspension of justice. So do not pretend that your religion is moral and just and then try to attack my position, which is based on reality, because somebody might rape people, shoot themselves ahead, and then not get punished. That's asinine. You keep going to this slippery slope thing of, well, if there is no you know, Ten Commandments or Jesus or whatever, then you've got no limits. You'll just run around raping and killing people. Well, that's already demonstrably false. And there have been multiple studies that, that actually investigate the correlation between the religiosity of a society and its societal health. And there is always a strong negative correlation. The more atheists the society, the better they score on societal health factors from everything from teenage pregnancy rates to STDs to happiness to wealth to, to murder, uh, murder rape. rape to um, uh, health care. Now, go out and do some actual research that contradicts this, and then you might have a case for your assertion that I think you'll live a better life if you're... No, you won't. There's no, there's no, dem there's no evidence to demonstrate this. Name an ethical statement made or action performed by a believer in the name of faith that couldn't have been by an, an infidel and name, if you can, this is easier, a wicked action that could only be mandated by faith and then you'll see how silly your question was wherever you were. The only thing you need to be a moral realist without having to appeal to transcendental values and, and other um, postulates is to one believe that morality is about questions of suffering and happiness and the difference there in conscious systems, not just humans. Uh, and two, to believe that there are right and wrong answers to those questions. I mean, is, it, is, it, is everything up for grabs or are there better or worse strategies to produce human happiness? And the moment you acknowledge better and worse there, you can be a realist and you can, and you can admit that these questions are open to the kind of refined empirical studies that we have yet to do, frankly. But that there's no reason to, to um, imagine that there aren't facts to be found there. 
Can it not be said, do you not in fact hear it said repeatedly about religion and by the religious themselves that, well, it may not be really true, the stories may be fairy tales, uh, the history may be dubious, but it provides consolation. Can anyone hear themselves say, saying this or have it said of them without some kind of embarrassment, without the concession that thinking here is directly wishful? that yes, it would be nice if you could throw your sins and your responsibilities on someone else and have them dissolved, but it's not true, and it's not morally sound. So few occasions to praise C.S. Lewis, and to, let alone to defend him against Dinesh, that I, I'm going to insist on doing it properly. Here is what Lewis says. He says, if Jesus claims to be able to take your sins on himself, remember, what we're talking about here, the, the to me revolting idea of human sacrifice, of vicarious redemption, of scapegoating, the idea that you can throw your sin on someone else and make him die and take your sin with him. The repulsive, immoral idea of vicarious redemption. I can pay your debt, brother, sister. I can. I will if I can. I, I could serve your, your sentence in prison if, if, I, if I was brave enough. Uh, or if it was allowed to me, maybe, but I cannot take your responsibility from you because it would be immoral to do so. You have no right to ask it of me. You can't shed that responsibility. The whole basis of morality requires that you face it and take it upon yourself. Nonetheless, Christianity offers the repulsive idea of vicarious redemption, and Lewis faces it, and this is what he says. He says, now unless the speaker who offers that is God, this is really so preposterous as to be comic we can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toes, I forgive you. You steal my money, I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden upon, who announced that he forgave you for treading on other men's toes and stealing other men's money? Asinine fatuity is the kindest description we should give of his conduct. This is Lewis. Yet this is what Jesus did. He told people their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult the other people whom their sins had injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would imply what I can only regard as a silliness and conceit, unrivaled by any other character in history. So people like Thomas Jefferson, a hero of mine, who said that Jesus wasn't divine, but he was a great moral teacher, Lewis quite properly spoke with scorn and said, that's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman and something worse. And Lewis, who's argued so well up till then, can't complete a syllogism. Poor guy, he never quite could do that. He said, since I don't think he was the devil of hell, I have to conclude he was the son of God. Well, you don't have to follow the paltry logic of that to see that at least Lewis is not making it easy on himself. Let's call it evil. Where does evil come from? Religion. <laughs> Nine million children die every year before they reach the age of five. Okay, picture picture a, a, an Asian tsunami of the sort we saw in 2004 that killed a quarter of a million people. One of those every 10 days killing children only under five. Okay, it's 20, 24,000 children a day, 1,000 an hour, 17 or so a minute. That means before I can get to the end of this sentence, some few children, very likely, will have died in terror and agony. Okay, think, of, think of the parents of these children. Think of the fact that, that most of these men and women believe in God and are praying at this moment for their children to be spared and their prayers will not be answered. Okay, but according to Dr. Craig, this is all part of God's plan. Any God who would allow children by the millions to suffer and die in this way and their parents to grieve in this way either can do nothing to help them or doesn't care to. He is therefore either impotent or evil. And worse than that, on Dr. Craig's view, most of these people, many of these people certainly, 
will be going to hell because they're praying to the wrong God. Okay, on the other hand, on Dr. Craig's account, your run-of-the-mill serial killer in America, okay, who, who spent his life raping and torturing children, need only come to God, come to Jesus on death row, and after a final meal of fried chicken, he's going to spend an eternity in heaven after death. Okay, one thing should be crystal clear to you. This vision of life has absolutely nothing to do with moral accountability. You know, something good happens to a Christian. Some, he feels some bliss while praying, say, or he sees some positive change in his life, and we're told that God is good. Okay, but when children by the tens of thousands are torn from their parents' arms and drowned, we're told that God is mysterious. Okay, this is how you play tennis without the net. Okay, and I want to suggest to you that it is not only tiresome when otherwise intelligent people speak this way, it is morally reprehensible. Okay, this kind of faith is, is really is the perfection of narcissism. I mean, God loves me, don't you know? He, he cured me of my eczema. He, he makes me feel so good while singing in church. And, and just when we had given up hope, he found a banker who was willing to reduce my mother's mortgage. Okay. Given all, the, all that this God of yours does not accomplish in the lives of others, given, given the, the misery that's being imposed on some helpless child at this instant, this kind of faith is obscene. Okay. This, to think in this way is to fail to reason honestly or to care sufficiently about the suffering of other human beings. M morality comes from the fact, according to David and, uh, and many people, that it was uh, advantageous to us uh, as a tribe. Yep. And so we, we formed rules which stopped us killing each other. It's perfectly true um, that once you've got altruism and cooperation seeded into a community, it confers a massive selective advantage. The question mm. which you need to address yourself to is how did natural selection uh, allow that seed to be planted in the first place? Natural selection is very effective but in going not, around stamping not, not on the seed. seeds of altruism before no, they jump up. Um, reciprocal altruism, for example, the notion that um, I scratch my back because you'll yeah. scratch me but back. Um, a tremendously sophisticated calculation of benefit and death. Let me bring Diana in here because you're an evolutionary biologist and this is, this is just your area. This is my area. Um, so there is, yeah, there's a great deal of evidence about kin selection, about reciprocal altruism but we evolved in very small scale societies in which every, every interaction was face to face and certainly if you look at biblical texts, if you look at even other religions, it's perfectly fine to kill out group members but it's not okay to kill in group members and if you look at how people act towards one another in one off interactions, people aren't very nice. There's a lot of reinforcement in society and punishment for people who aren't nice to each other. The society and the rules of society have been built around our evolved psychology which enables altruism to be possible. For instance in the military brothers in arms. That is a way of leveraging kin selection to make people altruistic. And the whole idea that you were saying before, that biology, the fact that we all have an origin story, means that there must be something true about it. Well, I think this chair is solid, but now physics has shown that there's a tremendous amount of space between, um, between atoms. The smartest species on this planet are all social group species. And what happens is you have to get smart in order to be able to infer the mental states of other animals. Now, if you take that and you try to explain the world that way, you will think that there's a universal consciousness that governs the world. So what we're doing is we're using our, our mind, which is like a hammer, to see the world like a nail. Our mind is good at inferring consciousness, therefore we're inferring consciousness in the world. These chimps can go to war with one another, but within their own in-group, it's very rare that they kill each other. They kill monkeys. No, but they don't have our levels of consciousness and Yeah, they don't have their levels morality. of consciousness, but you could say, why don't they all kill each other? They must have been endowed with God to, with an altruistic motivation. Ants will sacrifice themselves for the greater good of the colony. They must have been endowed with God by God with an altruistic motivation. People didn't understand how you social insects work until re very recently. And just because we don't understand how altruism might have been seeded in our human species doesn't mean that it has been endowed by anyone else. That is the but they don't uh, talk about that is a great example of a God of the gaps argument. They don't the talk altruism Hello, argument. Professor Dawkins. My name is Ngazi Arandu, and I am in London, England. In your essay, Man versus God, you ask, what is so special about life? And then you liken humanity to matter. If life isn't sacred, then why is murder bad? Why is child molestation, theft, lying? Why do we all generally in most cultures consider them wrong? Where do we get the notion of morality? From physics or from I God? Believe, I, cannot, I cannot believe you're suggesting that if you didn't believe in God, you would think it was okay to go out and murder people. 
Do you seriously think that we need religion in order to agree that murder is a bad thing? Do you seriously think that before, I don't know, Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and, and said, thou shalt not kill, the, the people said, oh, right, thou shalt not kill. Oh, how surprising. We didn't know that before. Right, in future, we won't kill. Of course, that's not how it happened. We have perfectly good reasons for saying we don't like to live in the sort of society where people kill each other at will. And if they do it, we lock them up and we think in any case that it's a bad thing. And there's absolutely no evidence that atheists are any less moral than religious people. Not physiologically, perhaps, but it's certainly true that it comes from the, from the brain. And it's very, there are very good evolutionary reasons why we should shrink from being cruel, from being unkind. One can make a very good case for that. But I want to come back to the point, I cannot believe that any person in good conscience would ever say the only reason that, I, that I'm good, the only reason I'm a good person is my religion. If, if you believe that, you're actually admitting that if you thought God wasn't, wasn't watching you, say, you'd go out and kill somebody. I mean, I don't want to know that kind of person. I want to know the kind of person who is good for the sake of being good. Where does morality come from? Does it come from the benzene molecule, the carbon molecule, the oxygen molecule? In your worldview, where does it come from? When, when Christians say, you know, God does stuff, but he does it through us. Well, that's the same as the story of the stone soup, where the guy goes into the town, he cons everybody into, he cons everybody into making this big pot of soup so that he can have something to eat by telling he has a magic rock. He puts it in the bowl, he tells them, you know, you gotta boil up the rock and we'll get this great soup. And then he starts saying, you know, I had this once before and we added carrots, it was really good. And by the time he's done, they've added carrots and ham and broccoli, and it's like everything's in the soup, and they make this giant pot of soup, the whole town eats, everybody's happy, and wow, his magic rock was great. That's an awesome magic yeah. rock. It's like, you know, you don't need the rock if you're going to put everything in there and make your own soup. Right. And that's the whole thing. It's like, you know, if God helps those who help themselves, to me, that's like the, the most blatant statement of atheism you could make. You bet. Because you're saying, I need to do it because God's not going to do it. Yeah. Right. So anyway. why, why bother with this God thing? Why not just go do it? Yeah, yeah. if you're doing it anyway. It's the same thing when we talk <laughs> yeah. about the Euthyphro dilemma, when we're talking about morality. Is, is something moral because God says so, or does God say so because it's moral? Right. If it's the latter, what do we need God for? We don't need an intermediary yeah. to tell us what's right and wrong. But actually, I mean, the, the, I think the main argument is that uh, God actually does just make the morality. Yes. Be because whatever God says to do, the Christian will say that is right. That's the direct response that I got from a number of Christians recently is that, the, the, the solution to the Euthyphro dilemma is that, yes, whatever God says is true, and if God says tomorrow that killing, that murder is, is, is morally correct, right. then that would be so, and we just wouldn't even think about it or question it because God would change our fundamental way of, of, of viewing things so that we would understand that murder was right. <laughs> and in this, as soon as they said it, I was like, well, there goes free will. Once you assume a creator and a plan, it makes us objects in a cruel experiment whereby we are created sick and commanded to be well. I'll repeat that. Created sick and then ordered to be well. And over us to supervise this is installed a celestial dictatorship, a kind of divine North Korea. <laughs> Greedy, exigent, exigent, I would say more than exigent, greedy for uncritical praise from dawn till dusk and swift to punish the original sins with which it so tenderly gifted us in the very first place. <laughs> However, let, 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 let no one say there's no cure. Salvation is offered. Redemption, indeed, is promised at the low price of the surrender of your critical faculties. So maybe I should just trust myself, not even listen to the Bible. Amen. There you go. Everybody here is clapping for you, Mark. Everybody. Now, here's the thing. Don't just listen to yourself. Because you can be wrong. I can be wrong. Jen can be wrong. We've all been wrong before. You have to actually make a concerted effort and look at what's going on around you and have conversations with other people. Because how do we decide whether or not we consider something to be moral or immoral? Um, it has nothing to do with what some old book said or somebody else's opinion. It has to do with the consequences of that action and realizing that your actions have impact on other people and their actions have an impact on you. 
And when those, when those, these are those things come in conflict, that's where we make vi uh, assessments with respect to our values. And yeah, because when gay people have sex, it doesn't hurt anyone else. Yes. Unless, unless like, they hurt each other. Well, you know, uh, we'll assume it's consensual. I know plenty of people who hurt each other in sex and are really happy about it. Uh, but we'll save that for another time. I got to go, Mark. Thanks for the call. Come to my church sometime. I, May 15th, I'll be there. We really like you. May 15th. Bye-bye. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get uh, started to the uh, line of argument I have here. Uh, so again, if, when you watch that video, you'll notice that a lot of times people are, are kind of just making a, a very blank basic statement that you have to have God or you have to have religion in order to have your, uh, morality. And I think that is appealing in certain ways. And I think there is a lot of uh, solace that one can find in thinking that one uh, has to appeal to a higher authority to have a type of um, guidance to what you're supposed to do. Uh, but I think that again, we, and it, it is a fair criticism because I think a lot of times from a science point of view that scientists will typically argue, well, science is just science, just facts. And I think that, and the argument I kind of, I kind of want to try and make here is to move a little bit away from, uh, that stance because it just takes you out of this argument that people find appealing for saying, give me guidance for what I should do. And I like this idea of a creator. A, a, a deity, a power to do this. And so um, I think this is a somewhat unique line of argument that I haven't seen much out there in the uh, the world of this, of the philosophy of this. So uh, follow along with me. And again, the main idea here is that what I want to do is use some principles of biology to say, well, how should we treat each other as people? All right. Um, there, now there's one kind of thing that needs to be granted, I think, in the argument, if you're willing to go along with it is that the survival of the human race is just the most important thing, right? And I'm going to say, well, we can't even have this conversation if the human race doesn't exist. The idea of morality is kind of irrelevant to us if we are not here to have the conversation or to have moral-based decision-making. Uh, so, um, and what I'm going to talk about some concepts from Darwinian evolution, and it's again, it's a very modern synthesis, of, of some, some basically sets of principles for human-human interaction based on, again, maintaining the survival of the human race. And so, just a reminder, and I've talked about this point almost in all of the talks I've given for science circles, so you can go back and look at some of those. Darwinian evolution is a combination of two forces, and that is you have this inherited template of a species, this DNA, these genes, then you inherently have to have some diversity for systems to evolve. And then as that diversity is there, these selective pressures that are exerted in terms of survival or mating pressures that you end up selecting for the most fit individual. And that um, this is how evolution works. This is important for the survival, I would say, of a species and its descendants. Because again, one thing you can, let me just point out that when we talk about the Homo sapiens human species, what we may ha what we could have two or three million years from now would not be Homo sapiens, but would still be our descendants. So again, that, that survival is thousands, millions, tens of millions. Now, how does this diversity help a species survive? And I want to just give a few key examples that we know from genetics that are, um, I think some of you are, are familiar with and ones I've actually talked about before. So bubonic plague and HIV have very specific infection routes into the body. And there are mutations in genes CXCR4 and CCR5 that eliminate the ability of these to be pathogenic within individuals. And again, there's an old show called Secrets of the Dead. That if you ever get a chance to see the one on this, it is just, a great episode that explains this type of biology. Uh, so again, in terms of, you know, if HIV or bubonic plague were to become so much more widespread in terms of potentially affecting and killing the entire human race, this is an example where a small number of individuals with these mutations allow for the race to survive. And this is what actually has been seen, and that's what, you know, multiple scientists have looked at this, but that the bubonic plague killed two thirds of the European population the first time it, it and then one third of the population. 
and then slowly fewer and fewer. And so, you know, the ability of a, of a plague to decimate our species can be limited by this diversity. Uh, cholera is another example. Cholera is something that was, uh, you know, pandemic and killed millions of peoples over uh, hundreds of years or, or thousands of years. And we actually have a mutation. Cystic fibrosis is something, I don't know, I put the wrong thing here. Um, yeah, no, that's right. Cystic fibrosis is something where it basically affects the ability of chloride channels to work. And so that's very bad for your lungs and ability to breathe, and you will die without medical intervention at a relatively early age. On the other hand, it protects you from the dehydration that cholera can, can have. Uh, another example is malaria, where he, mutations in hemoglobin lead to sickle cell anemia, but you actually get protection from malaria. And the, the high prevalence of the sickle cell traits in African nations where malaria is endemic is an example of, again, small numbers of genetically diverse people allowing people to survive. A high, in, high intensity UV light is something that induces cancer in the skin. And so the response to that is to, again, there is actually, this is a multi-copy gene, it's not one gene, but basically you have more copies of melatonin working and you produce more of it and that helps protect you from UV. Uh, on the flip side, if you go to a low intensity UV region, then um, you actually can get rickets. If you have really dark skin in a low UV intensity area, you can have rickets, which is a, a pretty bad bone malformation. And so again, the response there is to have light skin. Another nice, interesting example is that adult lactose utilization is basically keeping on the expression of the newborn genes, which is like the base design rate is that we actually have the ability to digest lactose as infants, but then we lose it. And there have been mutations that allow adults to do that. And again, that means that as agriculture rose to prominence and we used dairy, food, dairy as a resource, people had a survival advantage because they could get more energy and metabolism from that food source. Okay, so how does this, um, oh, sorry, one more example. I talked about this in my last talk about Darwinian evolution, that the more diverse this set of genes known as the major histocompatibility complex is, then the more robust your immune system is. And in fact, there's very good scientific evidence that we can sense more diverse MHC class molecules in a potential mate through pheromone signaling and smelling. And so again, this is basically showing that you can spread out farther your, um, your genetics, that if you can detect people that are more diverse genetically, then you can actually um, uh, have more healthy offspring. Okay, so when we think about these things of having diverse genetics, and um, survival of the human race, that it's in a sense a moral imperative as well as a practical imperative to say we should help the most people survive and to uh, have the best opportunity to reach adulthood, the best opportunity to choose their mates and have the rights to do those types of things. And so in terms of what we would think of as moral behavior, what's, what's actually valuable there is you know helping poor communities because uh, those are um, pools of genetics that we would not want to miss out on. Uh, again, promoting dignity and human rights, promoting peace and elimination of conflicts, and again, very importantly, the right to choose one's mates and the ability to, you know, basically, in some senses, control your ability to devote time and energy to however many offspring you wish to have. Now, I think there could be some overinterpretations of this, where, again, you could say, well, if this is going to be our basis for morality, then people who aren't helping reproduce um, should be excluded from any sort of morality. Uh, or we should engineer out good or bad genes, either through breeding or even maybe some sort of technology. Uh, and those, and maybe another argument would be that if you have really high reproductive potential, very unique diverse genetics, that you should be protected slash enslaved. So anybody who's watched The Handmaid's Tale, which I've not watched, but I know the, the basic idea behind it, is that that's kind of what they're doing. Um, and there may be others that are here. So let me uh, just conclude the argument, the, the proposal, that you should really be nice and respect everyone because his or her genes could be the salvation of the species. And I think that's where I will end it and basically uh, hand it off to Baragon to have a um, panel discussion. And again, I know a lot of people were commenting in local chat and I wasn't trying to personally ignore that, but I think we'll hold on to that and come back to that in the, in the discussion. Are you going to res a table or chairs? 
But thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, again, if you don't want to stick around for the panel discussion, um, feel free to head out. But thanks for coming. Thanks again for, especially with the last minute notice of, uh, I said, hey, I'll, I'll fill in for, uh, to have at least some sort of event this week when there weren't any other um, people on the calendar. Oh, okay. You know, I am seeing that Baragon does not have a white dot. For oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> Hello, testing, testing. Should I speak on voice to moderate the discussion? Yeah, I think I think so. Oh, a combination of local and chat. I think Syzygy and Tagline can uh, use text if that's more comfortable. Does that sound all right? Testing one, two. All right, very good. Well, um, perhaps I'll make a little bit of an opening statement um, uh, and uh, to get the conversation started. Um, Fumon asks what we think of Thomas Kuhn, who uh, is a philosopher of science and uh, was famous back in the 90s for uh, the critique of paradigm shifts in scientific thinking. Um, and I think a little bit detrimentally, I mean, my perception of Thomas Kuhn is that his notion of paradigm shift was latched onto by uh, anti-progressives, um, by reactionaries uh, to sort of, um, uh, um, in a sense, discredit science by saying that, um, well, everything we think science believes is true could be wrong because another paradigm shift is just over the horizon that will change everything. So I think in the long run, Thomas Kuhn's paradigm shifts um, turned out to be kind of detrimental. Um, and I also wanted to make a comment on the video that we watched um, because I noticed that many of the religious defenders reduced morality to physics or chemistry, um, sort of the inanimate um, elements of nature. But one thing I noticed is that none of the religious defenders 
um, recognized that just mere human experience um, uh, can provide us with, um, you know, the, um, the, the reasons for developing a moral code. Um, I was a little bit surprised. I mean, it just seems so obvious that the reason we behave well to each other is because our experience teaches us to. That just seems like the most obvious reason. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I kind of think that morality is a little bit like game theory, that, uh, you know, you learn how to behave in society by sort of trying different behaviors and adopting the ones that work. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, that's kind of my take on it. But maybe I can <clears throat> latch on to something that Baragon said. <clears throat> The uh, idea that we can have morality coming from inanimate matter. Um, this is uh, related to another comment that was given by, I think it was maybe by Yuri talking about how complexity can arrive from very simple rules, like from. Oh, so was, like, I can't hear. I see taglines, uh, um, voice waves over his head, but I actually could not. Oh, I bet I need to turn up my volume. Oh, was tagline speaking? Okay. Oh, there you go. Now, I had my volume down, but I hear you now, Tagline. Okay, well, uh, this is Syzygy speaking. Oh, I'm sorry, Syzygy. I, I, I have my camera too far back. I couldn't see the name. Right, so, right, right. Anyway, I was just saying that the complexity can arise from very simple rules. And uh, one example that was given in, in the di dialogue was the uh, – was the chess the chess rules? Uh, chess is amazingly complex and based on very simple rules. But I would also add that uh, you can have very simple equations that lead to very complex behavior, uh, fractal behavior. And I would say that uh, our behavior can arise from the complexity of inanimate matter because uh, uh, the, the chemistry, our biochemistry, is amazingly complex. Uh, well, yes, I'm going to endorse that idea. I'm a huge believer in. Um, uh, complex systems evolving out of the application of simple rules and also like the iteration of the application of simple rules, you know, like you mentioned with fractals. It's just iterating sort of a, uh, a simple set of rules over and over and over and over again, um, which also, by the way, relates to game theory because a lot of game theory experiments involve like the the uh, the iteration of a game over and over and over again thousands of times uh, in order to kind of really see how the rules play out this makes me think can you hear me Yes, who is speaking? This is That's tagline. Tagline, speaking. tagline speaking. All right, tag, great. Thank you. This makes me think of chaos theory. And that really is a great example of very simple things becoming extremely complex and unpredictable in a mechanistic way by recursive formula. Recursive processes tend to create the most complexity in nature, I think, or things that are described by recursive mathematics. Can you still hear me? Oh, mic dropped. <laughs> yes, we, I hear you. Uh, that was uh, brought out in this um, uh, video I watched yesterday about Simone Weil, W-E-I-L, who only lived to be 33, and she is known for a lot of philosophical viewpoints and uh, uh, she was in a search for uh, the divine as well. 
she basically starved herself and died of tuberculosis. But uh, uh, they talked about um, how such simple rules can lead to exceedingly complex and increasingly complex phenomenon on, and experiences. And related that to an idea of a God who would be infinite, but could somehow love the finite and transient like humans. I want to I want to latch onto something that was said uh, that was said in the dialogue about uh, about morality from the Bible, uh, talking about the Old Testament or, or, or the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there is uh, morality is considered um, is is rather brutal. Um, for example, if you find that when you marry a woman and if you find that she's not a virgin, you're supposed to stone her to death. Well, it shows a distinct uh, lack of knowledge of human biology. Um, uh, you can't tell whether a woman is a virgin or not. It's it's not that simple. It's not not as simple as whether the hymen is intact or not, for example. And so this more so-called morality is is based on on uh, ignorance, the ignorance of human biology, for example. I would say ignorance and territoriality and possessiveness of women as chattel or property rather than uh, it's, it reflects primitive tribal societies which were brutal. In terms of, uh, I saw a comment that even a God can't be infinite. If a God existed and were infinite, what cardinality of infin infinity would that God be? As infinite as the natural numbers or the rational, irrational numbers or uh, any set of all the subsets of any of these uh, larger sets. Yeah, I think those are called all of zero, all of one. Uh, I think there's an all of two as well, different levels of infinity. I'm not sure how the math applies to God in this particular case. Uh, he's generically infinite, so <laughs> infinite has become more defined in a sense. Maybe God is the she, if God exists. Maybe God is a non-gender or the third gender. There's so many possibilities. Yeah, and I, I do want to make a point for um, those who want to believe in God and believe in science at the same time, is that if you want to make that, you want to, you want to do that, then you can believe in a God that is infinite enough and that his expression to what you might argue is something that he created was that he did it through natural science and that there's not a, um, you know, a constant intervention of some sort of supernatural being, but that in some sort of very like almost quantum uh, status way that this universe is here through completely natural forces through a power that is, you know, kind of like super infinite in that way. But that's, again, so you can reconcile these from, a, I think, a philosophical point of view sometimes that way. Yes, I think that was Einstein's view of God. He uh, believed that the, the laws of the universe were what constituted God. And that kind of God isn't really a personal God. It's, it's, it's a, uh, a very impersonal God that r rules the universe, so to speak, through his rules, scientific rules that would approach pantheism, I think, of the universe as God. I would say in terms of logic, if one were 
trying to create a, a, a rigorous theory to describe a God or a deity that you would have to take God as a primitive notion and leave it undefined or else you'll run into contradictions. Testing, testing. All right. I hear you. Okay. All right, I'm back. Well, anyone who tries to define God is going to have a lot of problems either way. One point that struck me at, um, just a moment ago, at, uh, Stephen Hawking sta stated that if God had much to do with the universe, it was very limited and very early. And that was it. Because after that, it just unfolded on its own. Um. Yes, I think um, one of the problems you get into as you confront the complexity and enormous enormity of the universe is sort of the diminishing God. Um, it becomes increasingly um, hard to believe that and um, that a conscious God is able to kind of um, intimately, manage and be aware of all of that. Um, and so your notion of God tends to retreat into just kind of a motive, an initial motive force, um, or some kind of initial um, maybe motive thought. But, um, but, not the, but that sort of God is not really personally interested in you or really doesn't really, um, uh, uh, um, you know, is not necessarily aware of everything that's happening. I guess. Well, one thing I'd like to touch on is, is complexity. How, how do we? How do we uh, how do we explain complexity in the universe? Now, uh, as mentioned before in Stephen's talk, he's, there's a supposedly an intelligent designer, and he used the watchmaker argument, which is easy to deconstruct just from philo philosophical um, point of view. All you have to do is say that if the watch, because of its complexity, needs a watchmaker, then the watchmaker is even more complex, and you need a watchmaker maker, and then a watchmaker maker maker, and so on. And how do you explain the complexity of the universe? If you say that there's a, a intelligent designer, then you need a, a, a god, then you need uh, something that made god. Or if you somehow fold all the ma uh, the makers of god into god himself, then you still have a huge complexity that you can't explain. But there is a way to explain complexity, and it's strangely enough, it comes from the second law of thermodynamics. It's something that I, I read in an article once where the second law of thermodynamics uh, actually requires complexity at some level because if you start um, uh, entropy for example entropy of energy is basically heat any system that has energy is going to uh, dissipate some of that energy in the form of heat and when you have a system uh, let's say a pond slime which has many molecules most of the molecules will be very simple but some of the molecules a tiny fraction of them will become complex just by interactions between them. And those complex molecules will dissipate, dissipate heat better. And so some tiny fraction of those will become even more complex and so on until you have something which you could call a living being. And then when you get a living being, some tiny fraction of those will slowly over time become even more complex. And you end up with a planet of, for example, of human beings where we're certainly dissipating a lot of heat here. So. Even from, sec even from the second law of thermodynamics, the increasing entropy of the universe, you end up developing complexity from simplicity. You don't need a god to explain it or an intelligent designer. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, another uh, uh, um, view on uh, entropy that I recently came across 
on YouTube <laughs> um, was this notion that uh, nature tends toward having more degrees of freedom so that um, a complex system has fewer degrees of freedom. Um, entropy is simply the tendency of nature right, to have more degrees of freedom. The, you know, um, the, the simpler a system is, the more freedom it has. Um, and this, uh, this particular talk I was listening to, the lecturer um, uh, connected that with time, that that's why time moves forward, because um, nature is um, moving toward more degrees of freedom. I don't know, didn't quite follow the full thread there, but I'll probably find the talk again. Um, um, I think also the notion of, I think it's evident when you look at complex systems that they um, have the legacy of previous experiments or previous um, um, uh, attempts to make something work. You know, much of our molecular systems are, that were developed very primitive, the first, you know, life forms uh, that developed in the sea, a lot of those very primitive biological mechanisms are preserved pretty much intact all the way through the um, subsequent chain of life. Um, they're not improved, you know what I mean? They're not really designed, they're just sort of carried on with us, lock, stock, and barrel. Yeah, perhaps I didn't explain it very well, but I can give it an analogy. Suppose you have a little box of toothpicks. If the, bo if the toothpicks are in the box, you can arrange them in a huge number of ways, but they, they can be arranged in an even huger number of ways if you dump them on the floor. And when you dump them on the floor, is the pattern looks uh, of toothpicks looks random, but not completely random. You'll notice that some fraction of the toothpicks will form little structures, little coherent structures, only a tiny fraction of them, and that's just from random chance. And that's what happens in a pond of, of sludge. You'll have most of the molecules will be very simple, but through just chance encounters, some of them will become more complex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and that complexity is going to increase over time as more and more of those encounters happen. Exactly, but only a tiny fraction, a tinier fraction each time will become more complex. Mm -hmm. um, some people in chat are commenting about Yuri's point about how uh, religious morality tends to result in horrible outcomes <laughs> and i think uh, some in the video we watched in steven's video one of the speakers makes that i think it might have been uh um oh what's his name who's the famous scientist atheist i'm blanking on his name now but um the english guy cool. <laughs> anyway he yeah um he makes the point that you know <laughs> religious morality is so um great you know why are we you know stoning adulterers to death or you know um coming up with all of these sort of draconian punishments for what seem to be minor infractions and so forth it seems to me it's an uncaring world that we find ourselves in and humans have coped with this since early on by tribal behavior, gathering together with social bonds. And it's a survival coping mechanism, but uh, the, the brutality and the uh, yeah. me first is still always there. Yes, the, that reminds me of something I came across um, kind of studying uh, the history of the ancient world. And one of, uh, I think it seems to me a, a plausible scenario is that um, one of the purposes uh, early tribes kind of um, developed kings um, was this idea that uh, kings were could intervene with God to bring about a good harvest or have a successful hunt or good weather or, 
you know, um, uh, fertility, things like that. And that um, kings, that the, um, the authority of the king could be undermined over time if things went badly, that if, if he was not a good intervener with God. Um, but this, uh, I guess the fundamental notion is that, um, uh, you know, uh, primitive human societies um, were trying to um, come up with some way to uh, cope with the capriciousness of nature. Um, and uh, so there was this thought that, um, you know, some people have a more powerful connection with nature. And those are the people who can kind of intervene with nature on our behalf. Um, but of course, it tends to fall apart over time because actually no one can really intervene with nature. If it's good to be king, then it would have to be good to be lucky. Well, kings, I think, eventually delegated that authority to priests <laughs> so they would have someone to blame. <laughs> Good point. In a way, we are already intervening with nature. We are uh, heating up the entire planet. Um, of course, we, we're not really controlling our own nature, or we would um, stop that kind of behavior. Yeah, I'm going to just, if I can interject real quick too, that I think we've kind of focused a lot of the discussion of religion and morality on the Bible. And of course, there are other religious systems that find bases for for, um, for morality. But you might say something specific about the Bible and how people look to that as a basis of morality is that if you actually look at the history of the writing of it, that it really was written as a way of uh, centralizing power. It was written by the Nicene Council as a way of, um, you know, cementing power within, uh, was it the emperor yeah. at the time? Constantine. Yeah, yeah, that's true of the New Testament. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, and so yes. while they're, they're, they're drawing this from historical accounts or historical records that ultimately the form of which we're looking at the Bible right now is really, it's a propaganda engine for, for authoritative power to rule over a, a, common, a common people. And so I think, you know, um, that not necessarily, the spe specific strict interpretation of the Bible is not how like, I think modern Christianity necessarily works, but that, you know, the origins of how you believe what you believe is... Um, um, and how that's been, you know, been communicated and its origins, I think, is a really important part of this conversation when you think about religion as a basis for morality. Yeah, um, that is interesting. The uh, the Nicene Creed um, sort of came about as uh, really prompted by wanting to suppress heresies, because um, in the in the early days of Christianity. You know, all sorts of different sects had all kinds of crazy ideas, and um, the the Nicene Council was an attempt to formulate a a definitive authoritative theology, really for the main purpose of suppressing all of these crazy heresies, which only seem crazy <laughs> because they were rejected by this council. Um, and uh, that's something that churches, you know, constantly struggle with is how to keep um, heretics from sp from splitting off the, f the flock. One of the Stephen first things Go required ahead. Go ahead. is to find a term to categorize the heretics, like the term heresy itself. Mm -hmm. It uh, becomes demonic. Anyone who questions is demonized. Yes. I I think like the split between Roman Catholicism and the um, Eastern Orthodox religions has something to do with the nature of communion, sort of whether um, the host is transformed in some spiritual sense into Christ or whether, in fact, um, like it just Im embodies Christ's spirit. In other yeah. words, whether there's some kind of a phys – anyway, so that's kind of – those are the kind of little uh, hair-splitting angels dancing on the head of a pin heresies that can – you know, that just broke the church in two. And similar thing, I think, in, in Islam with, you know, Shias and, and – uh, with uh, Shiites and uh, 
and the others. You know, they, they break apart. You know, that all has to do with who was the true descendant of Muhammad, things like that. Yes, but I think I think the split of, of the of the church is it was more political, um, as as mentioned. Uh, the New Testament came from from this this council trying to suppress heresies, which is a, a grab for political power. But the Roman Empire was uh, had split into two parts: the western part that's and right. the eastern part, which is Byzantium. That's right. And that, that's and that's what uh, led to the, the breakup of, of the church, or at least that was an important part of it. Yeah, that's true. The politiz politicization of religion is pervasive and ongoing. Just recently, the Russian Orthodox Church has broken off from constant uh, from uh, the um, uh, well the the main body of the uh, 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 Eastern Orthodox religion in Istanbul. I started to say Constantinople. Um, but, Istanbul um, was Constantinople. Right. There was a song about that. That's um, right. But, um, Nobody knows why it works. Are, it's nobody's business but the Turks. Yes. <laughs> but they broke off because uh, I think the Russian Orthodox Church is starting to serve the Russian Federation government uh, under Putin's that, uh, directions. And right. is... Uh, uh, raising the issue of Ukraine uh, uh, as, yeah. as a reason. So that's pure politics. Uh, yes, and I have to say that's something I've noticed, that it's always been a little bit shocking to me how pliant the Russian Orthodox Church has been with authoritarianism in Russia. It's, I don't know. It bothers me. That may be uh, historical. Uh, the Russians were actually looking for a religion uh, many centuries ago, so they, they were flexible in what religion they would adopt. They, they would not adopt Islam because you could not drink, and if you wanted to survive the Russian winter without drinking, that they thought that was nuts. So, they, But they found that Eastern Orthodoxy would, would fit them very well, so I think they, they tend to be very uh, flexible. There was... Um... Uh, we could we could talk about this all day, but um, uh, it's getting on to about 20 after the hour, um, uh, a little bit longer session than usual. So um, much as I hate to cut it off because it's really getting interesting, um, why don't we go ahead and, and wrap up? for? May I make one last comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, in regard to the uh, uh, video I watched, that I talked about, it's, it's I strongly represent, uh, recommended uh, John Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R, -E -E Reads Chance by Simone Blatt. I'll put the link on here. And, Very good. Um, there was a point that they made that I thought was fascinating, um, that um, it's, really an amazing thing that one can summarize experience in a more compact way than actually experience, experiencing it. And uh, how does that happen? That uh, I, I tend to think of it as we have um, pattern recognition and uh, we have language. And so we can describe things in terms of patterns like the strange attractors mm. in a chaotic world. But um, um, and I think we have evolved so that we can see these patterns because it enhanced survival of individuals to be able to function in the universe. And this leads, this is my last point, this anthropic principle, mm. philosophical consideration that observ observations of the universe must be compatible with conscious and sapient life that observes it. Very good. Yeah, those are all great points. Um, it, it's really painful to have to wrap this up because we could talk about this all day. I'd love to take you all out for a beer, um, but I guess we'll have to wrap it up. Um, uh, before I uh, log off, sign off on voice, I did want to make a plug for The Naked Scientists, uh, which starts in about 40 minutes. Um, we listen to the BBC weekly radio science program and discuss the topics. So you're welcome to join us at NUBA to do that.
And to thank you for um, your attention today, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks. It's been great.